worthy of it all. Today we go to our next text in the next section of Mark, and it's Mark chapter 14, verse 1 through 11. And the Bible says, Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus. Time where God is supposed to be worthy of it all. And their thoughts, they're scheming how to murder, how to kill. And the only thing they cared about was what the people thought. And let's not do this right now. Let's just scheme. Let's just do it in secret. But the people may riot. You care less about what God thought about it or what the people thought. But let's not do it then. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly, indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? You can see him with utter frustration and anger at their hearts and at their perspective. As this woman is anointing his head and his body with this perfume, the only thing they can feel was indignation, wasteful living. How dare you do such a thing to Jesus? It could have been used for something else like the poor, elevating the poor above Jesus, though Jesus was not worth more than even the poor. Indignant about this lady's worship. That he stands and he says, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful, somebody say beautiful, a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. And you can help them at any time you want to. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for, any, uh, for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will, be, will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas, Iscariot, or Iscariot, whatever you want to use, pray for the brother. One of the twelve went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him, talking about Jesus, over. Mark continues in the actions that speak louder than words of the life of our great Savior and Lord Jesus the Christ. According to the word, it is two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread, both representations of the Lord's great salvation of the firstborn sons of the Israelites who were spared or passed over by the death angel while captive in Egypt. And the angel passed over every home that the blood of a lamb was applied upon the doorposts of their front doors. And then we had the festival of unleavened bread that they were celebrating as well, which was a festival in celebration of the Israelites' quick escape from Egypt in which they didn't have time to let their bread rise, so they baked it without yeast or leaven. It was the significance of being separated from sin. Both celebratory events represented a prophecy that, uh, that pointed to the Messiah and Lamb of God who would come into the world, die for the payment of sin, bring salvation through his death, burial, and resurrection that would break the bondage of sin that enslaved and enslaves all mankind. It is a fulfillment of these prophecies that make Jesus worthy of it all. Yet Mark pens in these three contrasting accounts of people's response and value of Jesus that describe a story within a story or the worthiness of Jesus or the lack thereof. 
It's a story within a story that is a bookend. One story here, one story here. But the premise story is the one that's in the middle. And we have that going on here in chapter 14. While Mark's gospel's intent is not to create a chronological order of the life of Jesus, but rather a theological life lived in actions that spoke louder than words to teach his readers the significance of Jesus, the Son of God and Messiah of the world. I say this because when you go to the book of John in the 12th chapter, it says it was six days before the Passover. And then he begins to talk about this anointing of, of Jesus by Mary. And so when you go to Mark, Mark's uh, first verse says it was two days before Passover. And it's easy to think that, hey, there's a contradiction here. But there's not. In the first section, which is one through two, they're talking about the Passover itself and what they did. The, second, the next section, which is about the anointing, Mark adds it in there, not chronologically, but adds it in there for emphasis of the theology of God, or in this case, in this case the Christology, the very study of Jesus Christ and his worthiness. And he puts it in there to teach us the significance of being worthy of it all. Amen? And so here it is. Jesus, in the middle of this thing, while bookend by two horrible responses of the lack of value and worth of Jesus, the Son of God, in the middle we have Mary. According to John's Gospel, it was the sister of Lazarus and Martha, that Mary, who would break the alabaster jar and pour it all over Jesus' whole body. And so Mark gives us this Christology lesson on Jesus, who is worthy of it all. And today I want to preach on three areas we must make Jesus worthy of it all. Before we get into that, I want us to see, according to this, the definition of worthy comes from the word worth. Somebody say worth. And worth is defined as the value of something measured by its qualities or by the esteem in which it is held. Value is defined as relative worth, utility, or importance. The word worship comes from the word worthy or worth of worship. And so what happens is that we come in and out of church and we worship Jesus. But then we leave church and yet we, we show by our actions he is not worthy of anything, let alone worthy of our lives. Worthy of our adoration, worthy of our allegiance, worthy of our obedience, worthy of the relationship he died for us to have. But he, we worship God every Sunday with our lips. But then when we go out, this is why Jesus makes statements like, but their heart is far from me. See, he can care less about what the lips are saying because he sees what the heart is doing. Amen? And so worthy. Being the value of something measured by its qualities or the esteem in which it is held. And today we're talking about Jesus, worthy of it all. The first thing that we need to see here is the fact that Jesus must be worthy of our reputation. Somebody say reputation. Verse 1 and 2, it starts off that now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, for the people may riot. How did it even get to such a uh, low esteem about Jesus? How did it even get to a point where they don't value this man, son of man, at all? That there is no worth to Jesus other than to arrest him and to kill him. And the way they got here is because they deemed him not worthy of their reputation. It was the chief priests and the elders of the people or the teachers of the law who would be scheming to arrest and kill Jesus two days before the Passover and festival of unleavened bread. A time where millions come together to celebrate and think about the salvation and deliverance of God and the hope of the coming Messiah, the Christ or anointed one in Jerusalem. 
It is the religious folks who are plotting against Jesus, the Christ, and planning to kill him because they refuse to allow him to come against their reputation. The very first thing that would remove the worthiness of God in our lives is our reputation. We come to God, and because we have that reputation that we have created for ourselves, whether it be if it's true, like reality, or for some of us just living through social media, and we already I done the papers on this stuff, that in social media, as we all know, we can be anybody. I can be Clark Kent on Facebook, and y'all don't even know. I can be the best father, husband, pastor, right, worker, you know, brother, whatever it is. Heck, I could even be a female on Facebook. I can portray this image on Facebook, this quote-unquote reputation as though I am a Christian, as though I am a man of God who is doing all that God has called us to do. I'm sitting there working it out. Listen, I'm going to show you nothing less than that. But it's a false reputation. For when we come to church or church like this and we hear the word of God and it goes in one ear and out the other, but we're so content with just having our reputation that the worthiness of God goes in one ear and out the other. And the thing is this, we get so caught up in this reputation that we start to believe it ourselves. We start to believe that we are these people that we portray to be on social media with the pictures and everything else that looks so sweet, it looks so responsible, it looks like they have everything all together. I just want to be like them. But then if they would just but remove the veil, you will realize what is underneath there. If you but just like, man, man, she looks like, he looks like they got it all together. Man, if I can just get a peek of behind the veil, how is the home life really? Are they really the husband they said? Are they really doing what they said they're supposed to do? And as you begin to look, the, like transparently, you begin to realize, if you guys didn't know, right, there's just nasty stuff back here. You begin to realize, man, there's boogers everywhere, man. Like, man, they just got, it's all jacked up in their life. Marriage is all jacked up. Kids, they ain't care about nothing. Some of them ain't even eating, it looks like. You know what I mean? But, you know what I mean? It's just, but on Facebook, but on social media, it looks like they have it all together. I mean, the name looks real nice, man, and it's got a little gold to it. They look like they royalty. Reputation looks so amazing. But behind the scenes, there's no worthy at all of Jesus. There's no worth. It's just a mirage of a reputation. And see, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they had this reputation that on the outside, it looked like they were men of God. On the outside, it looked like they had it all together. They were esteemed. They were looked upon with this, with this type of man. They were amazing. They were praised and worshipped. And they took this reputation to such a degree that when the actual Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world stands before them, that the only thing they can say is, we need to kill and arrest this guy. We need to remove him because he is threatening my reputation. And see, for some of us, we can't even get beyond that, let alone give all God the glory, the honor, the praise, and the worthiness of my life laid at his feet because I can't get past allowing Jesus to affect my reputation. I got a name to uphold. I got an image to uphold. I got to make sure that everybody thinks that I'm following every word in this Bible. I got to make them think that I'm the best husband, the best wife, the best brother, the best sister, the best leader, the best everything. I got to make it seem like that. I got to do little doodles and little things and little videos so they can see like that. But on the inside, God is like, you are so hollow. You're hollow because I don't live in there. Because your reputation refuses me the access that I need that goes behind the veil. So what is reputation? Well, let's see. The synonym is for reputation, as you guys can see on the screen, is Character, this character, the attributes or features that make up and distinguish an individual. See, but for some of us, all it is is makeup. And it hides the very hollowness and the very false reputation that you really have. It's just makeup. 
The other synonym is fame, public estimation, or status. We all know about our public estimation and our status. Amen? Oh, nobody can mess with that. I got to make sure that it's intact. Name, right? We know what names are. Titles, if you will, right? We got to watch out. We guard these titles that we have placed in our lives, husbands, wives, and whatever title you're deeming. Repute or the state of being favorably known. Operative word, favorably. Spoken of or esteemed. You see, for many of us, especially as human beings, we're content with just having these things right there. As long as it's in a positive light and people can think this, I'm okay. See, but God knows all things. And he knows if he's worthy worthy of it all within our own lives. Reputation designates one's distinguishing makeup as an individual that includes their public estimation of themselves and their status reflective of their titles in which they are favorably known and spoken of in the highest esteem that affects their lifestyle. And so it is a no wonder the religious were so against Jesus because Jesus demanded their reputations to come under his worthiness of them but they could not oblige because they were so wrapped up in their reputation in which not even Jesus could permeate and remove. They were so hell-bent on that reputation. They were so hell-bent on their lifestyle that the Word of God cannot permeate their life. And every time the Word is preached, every time the Scriptures talk about it, what we end up doing is putting our reputation on the highest esteem. And we're content with that. But as God is speaking to us, what does says the Lord, the direction and how this lifestyle needs to be torn down and broken so that he can build up a lifestyle that reflects him. And we're like, no, God, whoa, no. I thought it was just as long as I believe I'm okay. As long as I see worship songs at, at the church that, you know, I'm okay. I'm, I'm doing, I, I did the checklist. I should be good. But instead, what ends up happening is that we begin to plot to arrest Jesus and to kill him. And how does that look like? It is putting Jesus in a cell, in a compartment within our lives. That only thing he has access to is probably just a toilet, like a cell in any kind of prison. That we say, God, listen, hey, I believe in you, God. Yes, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you're, you're the Messiah. But, but God, this is my heart right here, God. And, and my heart right here, God. I, I gave you a cute little comfortable nine by six cell inside my heart. And, it, and it's right here. And God, like, God, you, you got to be content. God, like, you know, you're still working on me. And I know I got all this other stuff over here in the, in the heart. But, but God, I, I gave you 20% of my heart right here. I gave you access. You got a toilet, God. You got, you know what I mean? You, you, you got a little sink right there, a little mirror. You even got a little bed. It's a little hard, but you got a little mattress you can lay on. And then sometimes I go visit you while you're in this little compartment in my heart, and I tell you how awesome you are. You know, I tell you about the promises. You know, even sometimes I might even give you a pass, and because you know, over here is, you know, starting to mess up. You know, my marriage is starting to be exposed now. People are starting to hear it's jacked up. So, you know, God, I'll let you out, and I want you to kind of fix this. But it's not to stay out and start fixing the rest of my heart. No, no, God, after that, like, you got to go back into this cell, God. You, because the, the, the objective is to make sure that you're arrested. And anytime you try to go beyond that cell, okay, God, now I got to kill you. I got to remove you from my life. And see, what happens is God begins to expose the areas of our lives due to our lifestyle and our reputation where he says, yeah, you may say I'm worthy of it all here, but son, daughter, all over here is where I'm trying to get to. And see, because you don't allow me here, it only shows how much I am not worthy of it all. All of your heart, all of your mind, all of your actions, all of your lives, you only prove that. And even though you may hide it in front of everybody else, but I see everything because I'm always behind the veil. I see the wires. I see what's keeping you together. I see what kind of power source you're relying upon, and none of it is me. Jesus would always challenge 
our reputations and our lifestyle. And as a result of this, instead of honoring and valuing Jesus above their reputations, they instead plotted and schemed to arrest and kill Jesus, who was, who was a, a threat to their reputations. And in order to keep their reputations intact, their plotting and scheming had to be done in secret. Notice that it had to be done in secret. You see, we cannot ex allow ourselves to be exposed. So, we, you know what I mean, we'll go to church sometimes, but, you know, all that getting deep into it and really, like, diving in, like, I can't do that because the only thing if I do that, if I start discipleship, if I start these things, accountability, it's only going to expose my life even more. So if I can just stay out of that mix, I can always kind of creep behind the scenes and, like, oh, I'm good, I'm still over here. Oh, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Oh, I'm, I'm over here. You know, hey, discipleship over there. Like, no, not, not today. No, no. Y'all, y'all so good. Look at y'all, man, doing what God's supposed to call y'all to do. God bless you guys. You guys are doing amazing. You know, and then somebody get close over here to you and you just run to the other side. Like, wait a minute. Ho, ho. No, 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 no. I'm just chilling. I'm over here. How's the marriage? How oh, is amazing. It's going so good. Y'all don't see my pictures on Facebook. You got to see that. Family is good. Everything is good. Smiles and smiles and clowns, man. It's all going good. And the whole time, God is trying to get our attention, just like he was with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But they refused it because they couldn't get past their reputations and their lifestyle. And so, what does Jesus do? Jesus comes in. He shows us the actions that will soon speak louder than his words which he declares in Matthew's account. What does he say? He says, as you know, the Passover is in two days away. And look at what he says. And the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. He didn't say, hey, two days, we're from the Passover, and the Son of Man about to eat some food with y'all, and listen, man, I'm living forever. We're going to take over this whole thing. It's all about us. It's all about me. We're going to take over the Romans. We're going to take over these people. We're going to enter into that, that, uh, that castle right there. We're taking everything over. We're going to start the awesome reputation. No. Jesus showed us what it looks like to be worthy of all our reputation by giving up of his reputation and being crucified all but two, what, two days later. To be on a cross and to show us what worthy looks like. That when he looks at the ones who just nailed him on that cross, when he looks at the ones who put that nail in his feet and the crown of thorns on his head and whipped them in the back and that other dude that came up and speared his side where water began to come out, he looked down on them and he said simply, it is finished. Oh, I didn't care about my reputation because the value and worth was in you. Me, Jesus, I just speared you. I just put nails to your hands and feet, a crown of thorns on your head, and yet you're saying you died for me? Yes, even you. Even you. Jesus shows through his actions that it was not about his reputation, but quite the opposite, his crucifixion. While the religious folks are always concerned about their reputation and therefore plot to kill Jesus for it, Jesus is willing to be crucified to show that he is worthy of all reputations. We would never truly make Jesus worthy if we are more concerned about the worth of our own reputations, the worth of our own makeup, our own fame and status, our own name and titles, and our own esteem in which we place the highest value and worth in our culture and lifestyles. Is Jesus worthy of our reputation and our lifestyle? That is the, that is the question for this first one. Worthy of all reputation. Number two, worthy of all value. The second part of this, I want to look at the ending of this to our good friend Judas Iscariot, or Iscariot, not to be recognized by Jonathan Iscariot by any means. But Judas, different J, Judas Iscariot, who would soon betray our precious Savior and Lord. The religious leaders, mind you, they're looking, the chief priests are looking for an opportunity to arrest and to kill Jesus. But they haven't found one. They're looking and looking, and they're waiting for the best opportunity 
And the best means to scheme and secretly arrest and kill Jesus. And guess who comes on the scene? Judas. He comes discouraged in his own right. Let's see what happened to Judas here and why he couldn't make Jesus worthy of it all. He comes discouraged in his own right, a disciple and false follower of Jesus whose presuppositions and entitlement placed his value. Notice the words, presuppositions, entitlement, which he placed his value on Jesus in hopes to gain a superior position in the ranks of Jesus when he conquers Rome militarily or politically and sets up his own kingdom in its place. This was with the idea of Judas. I'm going to follow Jesus. He even had a prominent position, as we all know, as the treasurer of Jesus, even though he was taking tithes and offerings for himself, real low key and in secret. And so what does he do? He begins to build up this entitlement, this presupposition, this, this value that goes above the value of Jesus in his heart. And it was a value for material things and positions and the things of this world and this culture. And so what happens? He fails to find value in Jesus due to his own selfishness, due to his own greed, due to his pride as the treasurer of Jesus and taking some money for himself that began to grow. And now he reaches his boiling point and desires to gain value from Jesus by betraying him for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. It's the money he asked. He was so thirsty. If I can just get any kind of value from walking with this guy for three years, what can you give me if I betray him, if I give him up to you? He said, well, I'll give you 30 pieces of silver for the three years you've been walking with this guy. It was the price of a slave. And he didn't realize, but he was the slave. He was the slave to this world and a slave to sin. And because of that, his worthy was not in Jesus, but instead it was in his own value. And the worth of this world, it comes to nothing. Matthew 26, 14 through 16 talks about Judas and the betrayal of Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Why did he do this? He did not see or realize the value of Jesus in whom is worthy of all value. I'm going to say that again. He did not see or realize the value of Jesus in whom is worthy of all value because he only seen value in the physical and material rather than the value of the spiritual that supersedes anything physical and material. Listen to this. When we do not place the highest value and worth in Jesus, we will trade him for whatever we deem is more valuable and worthy than Jesus that enslaves us to the false value and worth of this physical and material world or enslaved to the instant gratification of pleasures and desires. The moment we don't make Jesus worthy of all value, we will trade Jesus for the next thing we consider more valuable than him. And for most of us and in the culture we live in, it's a value of pleasures and desires. It's a value of monetary, a value of one's own esteem and the increase of one's own reputation. It's false values. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1.18, Amplified Version, for you know that you were not redeemed from your useless, spiritually unproductive way of life inherited by tradition from your forefathers with perishable things like silver and gold. He said, no, you weren't purchased with those things. You weren't redeemed with some gold or some silver things that just perish but you were actually purchased with the precious blood like that of a sacrificial lamb, unblemished and spotless, the priceless blood of Christ. It's Passover and unleavened celebration of the festival of unleavened bread. 
and they didn't realize or see that it was the Lamb of God, Jesus, who was standing before them. And they placed no value in him other than to arrest and kill him or in Judas' sake to betray him. Jesus is worthy of all value because he, pray, he paid the price for you and me, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with his priceless, precious blood. Is Jesus worthy of all your value? Or relative worth, utility, or of highest importance, unable to, to be traded or equal to none, but rather valued to give up all for him. You see, when we don't make Jesus worthy of all value, it is for that reason every day we're trading him for something else. And then we go back, we repent, God, forgive me, God, forgive me. And he comes back because he loves us so much. And he said, if we confess our sins unto the Lord, he is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But what happens the next day? We trade him again. I'll trade it for the highest bidder. What you got? What you got? Oh, man, I got this. I got that, man. I got this female right here. And we don't realize the one we're trading with is that the devil himself. Oh, I got something for you today. Oh, look at this chick right here. Oh, everything you wanted in a woman, there she is right there walking in Walmart or Target or wherever you go. Oh, are you willing to trade? Listen, I, I did it, I, all your desires. I put it all in one person. And guess what? She got a little Tinder account. You can find her on there. And according to her account, man, she keeps it on a DL. And he's there willing and dealing with us. All you got to do is trade Jesus. All you got to do is betray him. All you got to do, listen, it's your taxes. You're trying to get that money. All you got to do is just lie a little bit, just a little bit. Just let them know, you know, you had a little extra cash on the side and stuff, you know, to get some more cash. Just go on ahead and just, just claim some kid from another little place or whatever. Just, hey, we got, just say you got a business. That's a new thing in this day and age, right? Just say you got a business. You're in the lawnmower business. Like I am? Yeah. It's called Lawnmower for Jesus. That's your business. I can put it down on paper right now. It's going to give you $10,000 more. And you could even create a business after that. For real? No, but I don't want to mess up. Hi, they ain't even going to find out. Nobody. For real? Yeah. All you got to do is just sign right here. And what we do, we sign. And then we think that we came up because we still woke up the next day, right? God didn't kill us in our sleep. And we think, man, maybe I'm good. Maybe, maybe they got away with it. Maybe the dude was right. You know what I mean? Like nobody found out. But we don't realize spiritually what begins to happen, right, is that our value of Jesus has now been lowered. See, the devil knows this. All I got to do is little by little remove the worth of Jesus and value in their lives. If I can just get Jesus to about right here in the value level of their lives, all I got to do is give them a, something that's like three notches up, and they will literally walk away from Jesus. They will divorce, divorce their spouses. They will do X, Y, and Z. Ain't nobody care about them kids, so they'll leave them kids behind. And all of a sudden, we've traded or be traded. Jesus. For some of us, it's a little bit simpler than that because our worth for Jesus is not that high. So all somebody got to do is just offer us a good time. It don't even have to be the opposite sex. It could just be just our cousin, our family. Dude, come through, man. We going to the spot, bro. We going to play pool. Man, it's going to be some darts there, dude. They even got gaming there, bro. It's going to go down, dude. We going to have a couple, just a couple little drinks or whatever. Man, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be good, man. Hey, don't worry. Bro, you're good. Don't even worry about it. But the devil knows all I got to do is get him out of this. Get him out of his value system. Put him in a system where there is no value no more. And you got to do, do whatever you want to do. You're hanging around with people. And I take him in the right place. And before you know it, you wake up the next day and it's not your king size bed. It's in the cell. And then you recognize you got yellow papers next to you. Open them up. What the heck is this? What did I do? Reckless homicide. What do you mean reckless? Oh, yo, you called a sheriff in. And he begins to tell you, yes, you killed three people. What you mean I killed three people? Yes, you were drunk and driving drunk, and you hit a family that was coming from church, and they just had a newborn baby, and all three of them are now dead. 
I literally met people like that when I was behind bars. And they woke up in the county jail wondering what in the world was going on. And they told them, you are in here for reckless homicide. I don't even remember hitting anybody. I know because you were that drunk. You killed two people. And one of them was a year old child. Do you understand what that does to a person? And the devil's sitting there just laughing. This is what he wants to do. And he is very patient to do it, to remove Jesus from being worthy of all value because the moment he does that, anything in this world is more valuable than Jesus. Give me a pair of Jordans, man. I Look, I'll betray him today. Give me a card. Look, man, give me the title. I'll give you the title of my soul. Have it. Take it. Jesus is worthy of it all because he, pray, he paid the price for it all. And when you recognize the value of Jesus and you recognize how much worth he is, we will stop trading him and betraying him for the most stupidest and most pettiest things of this world. Amen? That's what Judas did. And that's what the Pharisees did. But we have somebody else that did something else. Amen? We have somebody that recognized that Jesus is worthy of it all. Amen? Mark would place the perfect contrast to the two situations described in the gospel as we see right in the center of them, both to place emphasis and importance on the true worth and value of Jesus as exhibited by Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, in whom Jesus raised from the dead. It would be this example of worship and devotion that would describe Jesus worthy of it all and that which lacked and limited others from making Jesus worthy of it all. You had two kind of people inside this house and they were disciples of Jesus Christ, his own. And then you had Mary right there. And you had the one side I was like, ah, not so worthy, man. Value of Jesus? No, we're walking with him. We're trying to see what, is, you know, what he's about. Trying him out, if you will, like he's, you know what I mean, just some, some clothing or some, some thing, some trend that we can just try out when he's God himself. But then we have Mary just sitting there. And you could imagine what was going on in her head when Jesus says, just in two days, the Son of Man will be crucified. I could see the gears start to go in Mary's head. This man raised up my brother from the dead. My brother's sitting here next to me eating food with me when he was dead just not too long ago for three days. And so here it is, Mary. I could just see her just kind of sitting back thinking, meditating on who Jesus truly is and his worth. That something happens inside of her. Mary would consider Jesus and all that he has said, and even more, all that he has done, and recognize his worth and his value. As she goes and grabs her alabaster bottle filled with expensive nard or perfume made in and from India, worth over a year of wages, which was 300 denarii in Jesus' time. But if you put that worth in today's time, it's up to forty to $50,000 in today's year's worth of earnings. Forty to fifty thousand dollars. Some of us don't even make that much in a year, and yet she had that much in an alabaster jar, probably sitting there for years. It could have been a family tradition, just passed down and passed down, and nobody worthy enough to pour out that expensive perfume, let alone bust the whole bottle over somebody. But here it is, Mary. As her heart began to melt before Jesus, she would grab that alabaster box and she would break the jar of perfume over Jesus and begin to pour it over his head. In John's account, Mary pours it upon Jesus' feet, but she don't stop there. She goes down and she begins to wipe his feet with her hair. Some of us is like, man, look, this haircut costs too much for that. 
My braids cost way too much for that. My wig costs way too much for that. I don't even have hair to do that, literally. You know what I mean? And so we, we put all of these prices against Jesus. But yet here she is on her hands and her knees. And she's wiping Jesus, his feet with her hair. It's made, and as she's doing this, right, the, the, the perfume just fills the whole house. You imagine it. The smell of a perfume or a cologne that costs forty to fifty thousand dollars. You understand what kind of smell that's gotta be? That's like the best of the best of the best. You know, some of us probably got like Savage on or you know, whatever y'all perfume wearing these days, right? I got Armani on today. Don't come smelling me though, but you know what I mean? And so we know how much these things can cost. She has the most expensive one. And yet she pours it all over Jesus' head, his body, and his feet. She begins to wipe it with her hair. And she cries. And we're all sitting here, we're looking at it. And instead of looking, instead of looking at whose feet it was, Jesus. Instead of looking at Jesus for who he is and what he's about to do. The only thing they're concerned about is this foolish lady who obviously doesn't know how to do math. Foolish. On her face, hands, and knees with her hair, with this expensive, you know what I could have did with that, that perfume? I could have got me a new house, probably a new living room set in the loft. Like, I mean, bro, come on. Girl, you could have asked me before you did that. I would have said, at least give me half and then go do whatever you want to do after that. And you want to sit here and do it and they're watching her. And not just watching her just like, man, she's crazy. No, watching her with, watching her with indignation about what she's doing on her hands and knees and her face, tears, and, and her hair wiping up his feet. This made some of those present indignant, according to Mark 14, 4, that they began to say to one another, why this waste of perfume? Verse 5, it could have been sold for more than a year's wages or the money given to the poor. Sounded so noble, right? Sounded like it was awesome, but in the end, they were really just thinking about themselves, according to the book of John, because it was Judas, the one who really sat it, and then he began to influence the other people, the disciples that were there. And all he did was he wanted it so he can steal it and go get himself some more money and finally have some value and worth of walking with this guy named Jesus for three years. Oh, I'm going to get my money's worth. I'm not going to waste my life. I'm going to take what I need to take and use Jesus to his advantage. Or so he thought. And then they began to rebuke her harshly. This is to say Judas began to spread his wastefulness and false values amongst the other disciples that it begin to affect their act of worship, devotion, and dedication to God. They were all indignant. Let's get the definition of the word indignant. It is a feeling or showing anger, but it doesn't stop there. Look at what the other definition says. I can't make this stuff up, men and women of God. They were angry. Because of something unjust or what? Unworthy. What were they saying? Why are you doing this, man? He ain't worthy. Even his disciples. Why are you wiping his hair up with that perfume? That expensive? He ain't worthy. This is an unworthy act. You're doing something unworthy. It could have been done and used for the poor. Or so we would have said, but really it could have been done and used for us. We could have got out of this place, bought a little palace somewhere over here, man, in, in Yorkville or something. We could have went somewhere else. But they considered it unworthy because they considered the man of God, the son of God, the Messiah, the Lord, unworthy as we reclined on that table and she began to do these things. It wasn't a thing of the outside. It was a reflection of the heart on the inside against God himself who said, you are unworthy of these things. They want me to pay tithes, God? You aren't worthy of those things. They want me to do X, Y, and Z. God, look, you ain't worthy of that. They want to be on me, be on time. God, you ain't worthy of that. Wait a minute. You're asking for too much. You're doing too much. Now they want me to go on evangelism. They want to have extended worship too. 
What else they want now? What else do they want? They better not give me the mic. Don't you give me that bullhorn during evangelism. Don't you do it. I'm already out here now. Look, I'm standing here. I'm here. You lucky I'm even standing here, homie. Looking over my shoulder, wondering who's going to shoot at us. This is probably what's happening in our minds even today. Some of us probably even contemplating, like, should we go to church? You know, Stephen, man, like, you know, this man might just run clean across the street in front of cars and hand us the mic. How dare he do that and tell me to talk about Jesus as though Jesus is worthy to talk about him as he's reclining on the table upstairs in heaven. My man upstairs, it only shows the unworthiness of Jesus Christ in our heart. And here it is, they're rebuking him. What a waste. What a waste. He's unworthy. Well, let's get deep into this. Amen. Jesus tells them, leave her alone. You remember any time, any other time in the gospel that Jesus said, leave them alone? Ever think about that when y'all read this story? How many times people stood up and said, leave them people alone, man. Leave them alone, man. They're my peoples. He didn't even do that for the disciples. When he got up and he seen, so, um, uh, what's his name, um, Stephen there, about to get murdered, he got up from his seat, as we know, in heaven and looked down. But he didn't say, leave that man alone. He honored Stephen and his sacrifice. And he looked up and he said, man, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. And when he breathed his last, he went with Jesus. Jesus already know, oh, you coming with me, son. But it was here where he stood up for, a, out of all people, a female, a woman. In that culture, they didn't have a lot of rights. Not like today. Today, now it's all feminism, and that's a whole other study I can't even get into. God have mercy, right? Not that women don't matter, but God have mercy at the, how the devil's using this agenda to destroy the people that God called the head and not the tail. And what do you have? You have the force on the rise skyrocketing like crazy. I just heard of one even last night that broke me down so much, almost to tears. I had to hold back the pain of hearing, what? Why? But what is? Because we live our lives without the value and worth of Jesus. And so here it is. He tells them, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? He asks. Why are you doing this? He then declares, she has done a what kind? A beautiful thing to him. A beautiful thing. When was the last time you heard somebody worshiping in, 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 the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, we'll say, and, and God says, man, they're doing a beautiful thing. You ain't going to find it. But he does it with this woman, a beautiful thing. Leave her alone. Stop bothering her. While they made it all about the poor to seem pious or religious, Jesus, Jesus declares to them, the poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. But with me, you will not always have me with you, indicating his soon and coming departure. He then correlates his, her actions with his coming burial and, pro, and declares a prophecy that where the gospel is preached, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Now, let's talk about this for a second, right? As I close this thing up, Jesus placed her actions right beside the preaching of the gospel. Did you guys catch that? He said, listen, wherever the gospel is preached, she's going to be right next to it. Wherever they're praying, not only just in Chicago, New York, California, no, all around the world, what she has done is going to be preached everywhere, right alongside the gospel. When is the last time Jesus put somebody right along the gospel? Right here. To a woman who was worshiping, praising, and devoting herself to Jesus. What does it mean? But it means this. That what she has done must be in response to the gospel as a response that declares Jesus being worthy of it all. Why other, while others looked upon her with indignation or an anger because what she did was deemed unworthy to be done to Jesus, she instead deemed Jesus worthy of it all. Listen to this. While others considered it wasteful living, they thought it was wasteful living. They considered it wasteful spending, wasteful denying of oneself, wasteful serving, simply wasteful energy, and therefore wasteful worth and value. How did she get to such 
a value in Jesus, we might ask? She came to such a conclusion because when she came face to face with the true Messiah, that her heart became the alabaster jar. That was her being broken before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That she recognized Jesus as worthy of it all. And to this day, what she has done reflects what the gospel does in the hearts of people who are willing to make Jesus worthy of it all. To allow ourselves to be broken before him. To pour us out unto him. She did not care about her reputation. She did not care about the values of this world. The physical and material perishable things like silver or gold. She did not care about what other people deemed what was unworthy or worthy and can care less if they were angry. She didn't care. It was about the worthiness of Jesus. She didn't care if they were indignant. She didn't care if they seen her on her knees crying and wiping Jesus' feet with her hair in pure worship, devotion, and praise. She saw Jesus as worthy of it all, worthy of full adoration, worthy of full submission, worthy of full love and prostration. Why do we not see people like Mary, who Jesus declared was a beautiful thing she had done for him and something placed right next to the preaching of the gospel? Because we are too concerned about our own reputations. We're too concerned about our own values. Even this one, this one is so disheartening. When I see it, we're too dignified to worship Jesus like that. Oh, he ain't worth it all. Wait a minute. No, I'm, I'm going to get on my knees. I'm going to cry. I'm going to raise my hand, y'all foolish people. That's for y'all to do. That's Y'all do that. That ain't for me. I'm just going to stand right here. Real dignified. So no, I'm not doing that. I, I, don't, I don't do that. I don't operate like that. I got to let Jesus affect my lifestyle. I, get, I don't got to give him everything. He knows what's going on. He knows my heart. I don't got to make him worthy of it all. I don't got to do that stuff. No, man, I just I don't operate like that. I'm just not that kind of guy. I don't do that. Well, let's see what Jesus does. Let's see what he says. Declare these things about her. And yet, what happens is that we're too dignified to do these things. We're too dignified within ourselves that we refuse our hearts to become alabaster jars that are broken before the Lord because we refuse to be broken. We refuse to be broken and let ourselves go to the feet of Jesus in tears. We say we don't do that. I'm not like that. I have my own relationship with God. I don't need to get on my knees and I don't need to cry at his feet. And yet this is the very thing that Jesus praised. This is the thing that Jesus deemed beautiful. The thing that he spoke up and said, leave her alone. This is what he said would be remembered right next to the preaching of the gospel. And yet we say, oh, I don't got to do all that. I don't need to do all that. I'm not like that. The reason why you don't do like that, because that is the problem. It's all about you and not about him. It's a recognition that we have not been broken before the Lord God Almighty. Pastor, how dare you say that? I didn't. He said it. Why do the Pharisees operate like that? Why did Jews who literally walked and, and sat and slept right next to Jesus? Because he never allowed God to break him. He came with what he wanted, his value system, what he deemed was worth. He came with his own agenda, how I want things and what I want Jesus to do for me. And then we'll go from there. But instead, Mary just came with an alabaster jar and broke everything, the most expensive thing she had. And the most expensive thing that we have in this room today is our heart. 
Why do you think the world is trying to fight for it and, and purchase it every single day? It is our heart because it is the center of our being. And the most expensive thing that we can bring to Jesus is not money and words and all these other things. No, it is a heart that says, Jesus, take this alabaster heart and I break it in front of you. And the moment we do that, watch how fast you will get on your knees. You will get on your knees and, and cry at the feet of Jesus because you would recognize how unworthy we truly are. Oh, and how worthy Jesus is. You see, the only reason why we cannot be all just, just literally reserved for Jesus with all things is because we refuse to be broken. Jesus was, um, Mary was broken before Jesus. Broken. And when she was broken, she had no other choice but to get on her hands and her knees and grab her hair. Do you know the Bible says that the most honorable thing of a woman is her what? It's her hair. It's the crown of her body. And you know what she did with the crown of her body? She took it off and put it at the feet of Jesus and began to clean the dirtiest part of Jesus' body. And she did it because she knew that Jesus was worthy of it all. He was worthy of everything. He is worthy of my, dig my dignity. He is worthy of my allegiance. He is worthy of my crown. He is worthy of my knees. He is worthy of my tears. He is worthy of everything that I can possibly have. And because of that, I will lay at the feet of Jesus any given time. I will lay there. I don't care how they look at me. I don't care how embarrassed I may look like. I don't care what they're saying about me and the whispers I might hear. I don't care about none of that stuff. Why? Because I don't care about my reputation in that sense. I don't care about the values of this world and what they deem is dignified. I can care less. What I care about is Jesus and knowing that he is worthy of it all. Put some scriptures on it, Steve. David, a man after God's own heart, and every man that served God or woman one thing they all had in common is when it was time to worship God, they got on their hands and knees and their faces and prostrate in front of God Almighty, recognizing his worthiness in light of my unworthiness. And they all, all of them, laid bare in front of Jesus and said, you're worthy of it all, God. Abraham, Moses, and everybody and their mama recognized the worthiness of God. And it broke their heart to such a degree that God was able to use them. Look at David, one of the most broken men of God in the Bible. Samuel 6.21, David said to Michelle or whatever her name was, Michael, it was before the Lord who, closed, who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. Look at what he says. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this woman. This guy had woman there. Emphasis. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. What was he doing? David was out there. So he was coming back home from a victory in God. Took off all his clothes. Didn't care who was around. Took it off. Bare minimum. No shame. No nothing. And he began to dance. And praise God on the way home. And his wife, who happens to be uh, Sal's, uh, one of Sal's daughters, she's looking out the balcony. Some of y'all know the story. She began to talk about David. Stupid old David. Look at him dancing like a goofball. And she began to be, you know, the wasteful dancing. Look at him acting like an ignorant, he, 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 ignorant person. He got no dignity at all. Look at him. Look at him. And there's David just, just dancing away. I don't care about nothing or nobody. I don't care less about naked as can be. Just look, just whatever. Jesus, I love you, Lord. You're worth it of it all. You know, all this other stuff, right? Same songs we sing it like today. And then she tells him this. And she resp he responds and says, listen, woman. Right? Not against woman. Just emphasis. As he, was to her, he says, I will become even more undignified than this. How did he get there? The man at the God's own heart. He got there because every situation that he was in, he allowed God to break him and break his heart as an alabaster jar, and he laid it before the Father. Why is that important? Because some of us, if not all of us, should be asking and praying, God, work in me. 
Use me, God. Send me, God. And he's like, I can't because you're not broken. God, but I want to do this. I want my family to be saved. I want my children to be saved. And we're praying and praying. And God's like, I want to do that, but I need to break you first. I need to break. God, I want to operate. I want to do whatever you want me to do. Well, you, you say that now, but I need to break you. And until you let me break you, I cannot use you. Why? Because every time I attempt to use you, you're going to backslide. You're going to walk away because you're going to depend upon yourself because you're not broken enough. And so what happened with Mary, he was able to use her and to be an example for eternity until he comes back. Right? To use her as a testimony right next to the gospel. Why? And why in such a way? Because she was completely broken. She didn't care about nothing else. And today, family, God is trying to break us. He is trying to remove all that pride, remove all that emotionality, remove all those things that would hinder you, <laughs> excuse me, you from being used by God. He wants to break those things. But this is us. And sometimes I see us even doing this. And it's just so disheartening that I just got to close my eyes and be like, God, I don't even see that person, Lord. This is all about you and me. And how does it look like? It's stone face. Worship is going on. We ain't even standing up. We're sitting there. If we are standing up, it's very, very dignified, very proper, very, you know, gathered ourselves. And it's just there. And I got to, I'll be totally honest with you guys. I have to close my eyes. Because it begins to discourage me. Why? Because I recognize there's a brokenness that has not happened yet. Because if you would just, re just recall and know how much God took us from, spared us from, forgave us of, that it would break us every single time we stand in his presence and it would break us down all the way to the lowest we can go. And that's on the floor. Does that mean people on the floor are more broken than others? No, some people would be lying too because they go right back to that reputation. I got to make it seem like, man, I got it all together, man. So I'm just going to go on in and just, just belly flop right on this floor right now. And all of a sudden we see somebody coming straight from the backyard all the way in. And just bam. And we're like, what are you doing? God told me to do this. Man, look, I have to question that. In front of everybody? You could have did that in the backyard, homie. So yes, people can lie about being broken too. They can fake it just like with their reputations. But the reality is, is he worthy of it all? Is he worthy of it all? Let me end this. Will you be remembered as a religious person who were concerned with their reputation and its worth, remembered as a Judas whose value was not Jesus but of himself and this world, or remembered as a Mary who was broken before the Lord and who worshipped and devoted and praised Jesus as the one worthy of it all? And worthy of her all. Or will you allow, or will you allow the Lord to break you as you recognize his worth and value and worship him? Devote yourself to him and praise him as one worthy of it all with all your all. Jesus said she did this considering his burial. This was to say that she was broken considering his burial that would include his, his crucifixion. When we recognize what she already, when, when we recognize what she already had done or what he already had done for us, in which he redeemed or, or deemed us worthy to die for, that we begin to recognize that Jesus is worthy of it all in return. Will you become a living alabaster jar, broken before the Lord, who is worthy of it all, who doesn't just talk about it, but lives like Jesus is worthy? Every person in the Bible that was used by God was a person that was broken by God. And today, we have a decision. We can keep the alabaster box, which is our heart, and say, I oh, know, better not. I got reservations. I don't want to look stupid. This ain't that. But we can say, God, listen, I don't have much to give, but I have my heart. And God, this heart, which is my own alabaster box, God, I break before you to be used by you, and I put it at your feet. That is what God is calling us to do today in every person in response to his gospel. And the choice is ours. Amen.